Hello and welcome to Straight Talk, Supply Chain Insights, the podcast for your supply chain leader who is on the go and wants to be in the know. And now, your host, Laura Sassiri. Welcome to Straight Talk with Supply Chain Insights. My name is Laura Sassiri and this program is designed for the supply chain leader who's on the go, or at least we were before we had the virus and the pandemic, and wants to be in the know. I'm interviewing supply chain professionals around the world to get their insights on what this pandemic means and how they see the forward plans for supply chain leaders and give advice. Today, I'm very honored to interview Yossi Sheffi. Yossi is a professor and director of the Center of Logistics at MIT and very renowned in the supply chain for leadership. Yossi, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Yeah, and Yossi, you know, tell the group a little bit about yourself. I mean, I have a lot of respect for your work. You're one of the pioneers in supply chain, but others may not know of your work. So can you tell the group a little bit about what you do? Sure. I'm a professor of engineering system at MIT. And as you mentioned, I was a, I'm was i head of the MIT Center for Transportation Logistics, which is one of the largest academic centers of its kind. At MIT, we also have, uh, I started the five centers around the world uh, that are basically academic center for logistics and supply chain management, graduate program all in uh, Colombia, Luxembourg, Spain, China, and Malaysia. We also have a very large online program with uh, 350,000 learners all around the world from any country, every country around the world. The program that MIT called MicroMasters, it's five courses plus exams and problem sets and all this. And if you get it, you can come to MIT and get a master in one semester. Or to one of 21 other universities who organize this. Throughout my career at MIT, I actually left MIT five times. I started five companies. There are also, I came back to MIT. I guess I can hold a job. I uh, didn't know that. That's an interesting story of a podcast all on its own. Yeah. <laughs> Before that, I um, I grew up. I was born and grew up in Israel. I uh, flew airplane for the Israeli Air Force for five years, then came to MIT, did my PhD, my master's PhD at MIT, and stayed on the faculty. So I've been on, been at MIT now for been in Boston for forty five years. So a while. Well, I have a lot of admiration for what you're doing in education for supply chain leaders. So we are forecasting a shortage in 2030. But let's step back and talk about the pandemic. What are you learning through this pandemic? So, uh, many things, but let me mention first one thing that the media does not cover. And this is the, uh, we hear a lot of complaint about empty shelves and uh, you know, medical supplies are not coming to the to the right places and missing ventilators and masks. At the same time, we forget that, uh, of course, the real heroes are the frontline uh, medical medical workers, but the unknown unsung heroes are the millions of people who work in supply chain. The fact that with such unprecedented demand, we have uh, still food in the supermarkets is nothing short of amazing. I actually took the uh, the media to task when they show all these empty aisles and empty um, empty stores because they take all these pictures in the evening, and I, you know, screaming bloody hell that they should take the picture in the morning. They'll show all the aisles of food because they don't realize that the um, people are stocking up the aisle overnight. So I just uh, just published this morning. A, a post, I, I do a LinkedIn influencer post. I just publish it and say the, their finest hour because this is something that uh, I believe, first of all, it's nice to see nice. It's amazing to see everybody talking about supply chain suddenly. You know, the profession that was never, you know, front and center. Now, now people are really, my God, supply chain. So my guess is that 2030 is not going to be such a problem because a lot of people are going to flock into understanding how does it work? What are people doing who are on supply chain? How do they make all this daily miracle happen? So that, that will be one, uh, one thing that will come out of this. 
another thing, obvious, the, some of the obvious things, uh, people who were not very good before at the um, risk management preparation and running supply chain under distress are going to get better at it or, or they're not going to make it. Good companies have processes for this. And we can talk more about what kind of process more people should be doing now, both to stay to, to make sure the business is going on and with an eye towards how do we come out of this? How do we make sure that the, when this is over, and it will be over, we are still in business, we are still running strong. Well, Yossi, I tell people if they want to help, they can go have hot meals for the truckers and the truck stops, right? You know, they're, they're working overtime. The lines outside the distribution centers, the manufacturing plants are just a testament to what you're saying. I mean, the unprecedented demand at the grocery store and also for medical device and, uh, you know, PPE. So... What is your recommendation for people in supply chain, you know, people in planning, people in operations? I, I mean, most people listening to this program are running manufacturing or planning teams. So what is your recommendation for people? There's a, a, when we talk about supply chain professionals, they deal with, the, uh, with, with suppliers and with customers. So first of all, there have been uh, some writer who suggested that uh, you first of all conserve cash. And we know cash is king in times like this. Even though with now with the $2 trillion bailout or whatever you call it, uh, there is more liquidity in the market. And there will be even more. The Fed is committed to more. The government is committed to more. So I don't think liquidity will be a problem like 2008. Yes, people are conserving cash. And when you conserve cash, the first thing that the procurement people are doing is they are paying, they are lengthening the, uh, the term of payment with their suppliers. You cannot do it uh, without real analysis because you may be putting some critical suppliers at risk. They may not survive this. And if you want to make sure that you come out of this in good shape, you have to protect suppliers. And there are lots of ways of protecting suppliers. In 2008, Company extended their own credit to their suppliers. Companies even invested in suppliers. So there are many, many ways of doing it. The, the next, the, the, the uh, downstream in the supply chain are the customers. And you may be in a position that many companies are in. You cannot either make all your products because you don't have enough parts or intermediate products, or you have to decide how to prioritize customers. Again, some writers suggested that you prioritize customers based on who is the most profitable. This is a very, very short-term view because, <laughs> for example, I don't think if you just made your, your first sale to Walmart, you want to you know, not supply Walmart because this can take you to the sky I mean, if, if this works through Walmart. Then there may be also customers who are very small customer, totally dependent on you, sitting in a community that depends on you, you can just kill them. This will create a storm of PR that, uh, that may negate any benefits that you think you have. So it has to be very careful analysis of how to prioritize customers. Above all, you should be seen as fair and not, um, not uh, giving certain customers what you don't give uh, you don't give other customers. Uh, some people uh, during the Thailand floods, for example, try to do auctions, which economists will tell you is actually the most efficient way to distribute the product because you, you give it to the highest bidder. In fact, you give it to the customer who needs it most. Just remember that the, all the other customers will look at it as profiteering. They will not look at it as you are trying to... Uh, to do what economists are saying is the best way of doing it. And we had, during the Thailand floods, we had evidence that the companies who did auctions, once the, uh, the floods had received, everything went back to normal and they actually lost some, uh, some customers. So you have to think very carefully on both suppliers and customers. How do you treat everybody? How do you prioritize? How do you support? And uh, you better do it now or the crisis becomes even worse. Well, my research shows that about a third of manufacturing companies have supplier development programs where they can dispatch teams to help suppliers. Uh, but 
most companies have forgotten, I think, the fact that relationships matter in the supply chain, particularly with transportation. And, you know, we've got all this uh, focus on RFP and lease cost. And, you know, we may not have a feasible plan. And, you know, these suppliers need cash and we've pushed cost and waste back in the supply chain. So I'm hoping people heed your wisdom uh, to think about this, particularly the trucking industry, right? Because so many people have, you know, been, you know, working on receivables and trying to get past these payment terms. And it's really tough, particularly right now with volume for those truckers. So great advice. Well, when you think post pandemic, which, you know, while the curves are lengthening, you know, we will get out of this. What do you think the supply chain looks like and how do you think it changes? Okay, for many companies, it's not going to change. Uh, but for let's forward thinking companies, a lot of people are asking whether supply chains are going to move out of China, whether we are going to start deciding something that, uh, you know, President Trump was call, calling for before of moving uh, moving production in, back uh, onshore. This is not likely to happen, and if it happens, it's going to happen slowly. Because China today, people go to China not only because it's low cost. China has become, in many segments, an innovative producer and can move capacity and create supplies very, very quickly, quicker than most other parts of the world, including the United States. But I would see, so I don't see people moving out of China. I see them balancing the uh, the supply. So they may have, you know, 70% of uh, supply from China, but they make sure that they have a local supplier that they give 30% or whatever, even though it may it may cost more, but also manage it better so that the local supplier is used for agility and flexibility and the uh, Chinese suppliers use long-term purchases. One should remember, I that uh, some companies looking at uh, the American supplier will decide that they need to balance it with the Chinese supplier or with the European supplier or with South American supplier. That the fact that uh, we need some geographical balance is something that uh, hits both ways. Uh, not, not everybody is going to move to Michigan. It's uh, <laughs> Now, there will be people who will decide that because of certain government regulation, whatever, they need to be under a different regime, or at least in part. But by and large, I see more balancing. People will move more to um, U.S., Europe, Canada, North America maybe in general, but not. I don't see it moving totally. I see it simply moving in part or on the margin, just to balance to, to have dual or multiple sources rather than rely on uh, Uh, on a single source, especially if the single source is China. Yeah, I'm wondering, Yossi, if you think we'll be doing more serious network design work and looking at regional sourcing, because, you know, China is such a big market uh, that, you know, we have to have, you know, global markets serviced. Uh, But, you know, my research shows that only 15% of companies are actively designing supply chains holistically across make, source, and deliver, and looking at buffer strategies. And I'm wondering if we become more serious about this. Your thoughts? I hope. (laughs) Me too. I hope, because it's a... And maybe this is... Maybe let me just be be positive for a minute. Maybe this will come out of what we talked about before. The fact that suddenly supply chains are front and center and people will invest more in their supply chain. Will a, It will attract more talent to the profession. It will get even higher up. We will start having more and more CEO coming, coming out of this profession and certainly chief supply chain officer that sit in uh, as part of the decision making and have budget for hiring and uh, um, promoting talent. So I think that one of the ramification of the huge you know, light that now is being put on the supply chain, people will start realizing that, gosh, this is important <laughs> and we need to have talent there. 
and we need to know how to manage this, and we need to plan, and we need to design the network and have the relationship and have the software and have, you know all the things that we are talking about that leading companies are doing will start uh, going through the market and going to most other companies. So this could be one point of light in this. I think it'd be a great thing. You know, I was a chemical engineering major and I couldn't get through school without designing heat exchangers and distillation columns. But I'm amazed that most people design manufacturing plants, but not necessarily supply chains, right? They inherit their supply chains and haven't really thought about buffer strategies and holistic flows. So I'm hoping that maybe this affects it. I'm also hoping that we look at opportunities for innovation, whether it's open source analytics or the digital twin or some of the new forms of simulation. I'm hopeful that we can drive innovation in technology. Uh, what do you think there? And if so, what do you find interesting and exciting? What do you find interesting and exciting? Lots of stuff. Look, we, we live in, a, in an era of actually unprecedented innovation. I mean, even in areas that apply to, to supply chain management, not only analytics, when you talk about optimization and simulation, they are now being uh, supported by machine learning and AI that can enhance many of these uh, tools. But, uh, you know, 3D printing that can maybe come of age right now because we see quick 3D printing that can help with general PPE. And MIT just, um, I think today or yesterday, made a press release that we have developed in, in uh, working with a local, uh, a local manufacturer, a way to produce masks, masks, you know, that these uh, uh, healthcare workers are saying. Within a week, we are ramping to a million a day. I mean, that's... Uh, Good um, for you. The thing is not is not not so much uh, the innovation, but the ability to scale it up and ramp it up. Yeah. And, uh, it, and so it's is worked. this 3D printing you see that you're doing this with? No, a lot of the original work was done with 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing, all of the prototype was done with 3D printing, but the manufacturing in this scale cannot be done yet with 3D printing. 3D printing is good. Um, it's too slow for this, and this is going by. You know, <laughs> This is going with fast machines. Anyway, of course, there'll be... Uh, so 3D printing was absolutely crucial in, in making this happen, but the manufacturing itself is not done with a, a, a 3D printing. There will be... You know, well, we are going into the era of autonomous vehicles. So how will uh, the automation in general... We see automation warehousing already in, uh, you know, Kiva, Amazon, and many, many, many others. I, I visited the JD.com warehouse uh, distribution center in Shanghai that used to have 400 people. Now it has four. Totally automated, really something to see. Uh, but but they are not. And the store, retail stores, and everybody is, is, you know, automating. We're coming to the area, to the era of, let's say, autonomous vehicle. We'll see how that works. But uh, my, in my forecast, and I hope I don't leave to regret it, it's always dangerous to have a forecast, but I think trucking will come ahead of uh, uh, passenger vehicles in terms of automation. I think on the highway, people going from exit to exit, not into the city, but exit to exit trucking, it will be autonomous and then at truck stops next to the city, there'll be some uh, electrical tractors that will take, take the trailer and bring it into the store or into the city uh, warehouse. This is uh, almost, almost out there. There have been a lot of testing and it seems to work. So, uh, you know, how would this impact the work? How would this impact the, all the truck drivers out there? How would this impact warehouses? We see all this automation is, is coming. I tend to think maybe because I'm a professor that a lot of the answer lies in education, in getting people to be to operate all this uh, all this system. It's not clear that there'll be one-to-one -one replacement for job, and there are a lot of uh, lots of concentration and lots of heartache over this. Uh, how bad will it be? Throughout history, we saw that uh, whether it was the industrial revolution or the fact that the uh, 
at the beginning of the last century, there were all 40% of the U.S. was working in agriculture. It's now 3%, and yet there's no massive unemployment. But doing the change is usually massive unemployment. So we are, you know, as we go and automate everything, there will be a dislocation period, which is not fun at all. Now, we're seeing a taste of this right now. Right? A taste when uh, millions of people are being thrown out of work. We are talking about 10, 15%, maybe some people are talking 20% unemployment in the United States. This is an example of a subst- substantial dislocation. And we'll see how we deal with this. The problem with now that the coronavirus, when the government officials are afraid for their skin, they do something about it. Whether it would come through automation and it's not that immediate, we'll see if they'll be able to, the government or companies will be able to uh, to help. Yeah, I think the autonomous vehicle offers a lot of promise for logistics. Um, you know, driving cross country is long and boring, and uh, you know, if we can make that safer, um, just a lot of opportunity. So, Yossi, moving forward as we think about the future, um, any last recommendations for supply chain leaders as they move forward? Sure. Uh, first of all, something that I don't have to say because most people understand, appreciate your people doing now, try to make sure that they have all the equipment that they need to do their job. Because right now, supply chain professionals Operators are on the front line, being truckers, warehouse people, farmers in the field. Even the retail clerk, clerk and the people who deliver to the home are all on the front line right now. So they need all the support that, uh, that they can get. In terms of, uh, of going forward, we talked about most of the things that companies should do for the business. But I'd like to finish it by focusing on the people who actually are doing the job. Well, Yossi, thanks for joining the show today. Best of luck. Stay safe. Thank you very much for having me. Stay safe, your pleasure. Really nice talking to you. Yes. Take care. Bye now.